My birthday was on June the 28th, and I went to work the next day, and uh, when I got to work, I had driven to work, and I got out of the car, and I had a pain in my leg. Ralph Dockham didn't know that an aneurysm in his abdomen had ruptured. He began to bleed to death internally and collapsed in the parking lot. A colleague called 911, then called Ralph's partner, Andrea. I was at work, sitting at my desk, and I got a phone call. Um, some person had found Ralph in the parking lot. An ambulance sped Ralph to Harborview Medical Center and into the hands of vascular surgeon, Dr. Nam Tran. When he arrived here, he was quite sick. He was on the ventilator, had a tube in to help him breathe because he was unconscious. His blood pressure was low because he was actively bleeding. I do remember them picking me up and putting me in the ambulance, and then everything kind of like faded out. And what you see on that bottom right panel is the aneurysm. Hmm. Ralph's aneurysm occurred in the abdominal section of his aorta. As chief of UW Medicine Vascular Surgery, Dr. Benjamin Starnes sees many of this type of aneurysm. The aorta is the largest blood vessel in the body, and it comes out of the heart and uh, gives off three blood vessels that feed the brain and the upper extremities. And then it comes down along the vertebral column in the chest and enters the abdomen where it gives off additional vital branches to the uh, kidneys, the liver, and the intestine. And then it divides at about the level of the belly button and goes down to the legs. An aneurysm is a dilation of the blood vessel that occurs when an arterial wall is weakened, causing it to swell outward. If you can think of a balloon, sort of one of those long, elongated balloons that people use to shape into different animals, and you take, take the balloon, and that balloon has a little um, weakness in one of the wall, and as the balloon gets larger, that weakness in the wall will get larger and larger, and essentially that's what an aneurysm is, it's an abnormal enlargement of, of that balloon or that blood vessels. When the pressure becomes too great, the aneurysm may rupture. The result can be catastrophic. The way that I would look at a rupture of abdominal aortic aneurysm is that it is a major insult to an individual. It's, it's similarly to, have, to be severely injured in a, in a war, to get shot, and it's, you are bleeding out. Ralph survived, in part because he was taken to Harborview Medical Center. Harborview is the level one trauma center for a four-state region. It's a primary referral center for ruptured aneurysms, treating some 50 cases a year. New techniques pioneered here have significantly lowered the mortality rate for these patients. Three years ago, we here at Harborview Medical Center implemented a protocol for managing patients with ruptured aneurysms using minimally invasive techniques, the endovascular procedures. And we were able to reduce the mortality in half, to cut it in half, for the first time in 30 years, in three decades. Using this minimally invasive technique allows the vascular team to control bleeding before putting the patient under general anesthesia. When patients present to us in hemorrhagic shock, they have bled into their abdomen, they're in pain, their muscles are tense, their blood vessels are clamped down, and those patients come into us in a very, very tenuous state, uh, and their, their blood pressure is very low. When we bring those patients into the operating room, if we, in the past, we would, uh, we would prep the patient awake, and then we would look over the screen to the anesthesiologist, and we would say, okay, go ahead and put him to sleep. And as soon as the patient was induced, he would lose that protective reflex, those protective mechanisms, and the abdominal wall musculature would relax, and the patient's blood pressure would plummet. Uh, down into the 20s and 30s and sometimes to nothing. And it was a mad rush to, to enter the abdomen and to get a clamp on the aorta and try and resuscitate that patient and get them back. Now, without any anesthesia or just some mild local anesthesia, we're able to bring those patients into the room, keep them awake, place a needle and a catheter into the artery in their groin, and go up with an aortic occlusion balloon and just simply inflate that balloon, much like placing a clamp on the aorta. The vascular team successfully performed this technique on Ralph, followed by traditional open surgery to replace the aorta. He had lost a lot of blood by the time he got to us and we had to support him throughout the operations with uh, a large amount of um, blood products 
but we were uh, luckily able to get him through the operations. Um, and I really distinctly remember coming out to the cafeteria to talk to his uh, significant other, Andrea. He said that Ralph had made it and that he'd fixed him and that uh, he told me at the time what possible complications of this condition might be. And I thought to myself, but he's okay. He just got out of surgery. These things aren't going to happen. He's going to be okay. I still remember the way she was looking at me when I first uh, started to be, come around to consciousness after surgery. And that look of relief and a smile on her face. Uh, she just looked like, oh, he's back. Yeah, it's really nice out here. Yeah, we've got good weather today. Ralph did experience complications from the rupture, dangerous complications that kept him in the hospital for three months. After 31 years together, Andrea prayed she wouldn't lose him. She trusted his medical team. Of all the times, he tried to tip over to an, into eternity, and he did. Three, maybe four times. The people in ICU, uh, they kept pulling him back. They wouldn't give up on him. They would not let him go. I would want my family to be treated the way that I would want to treat someone. And if you, at the end of the day, um, you know, all the statistics, all the scientific paper, all those things, and you take all those things and you just kind of put it aside, and you sit down and you ask yourself, how would I want my father and my mother and my wife and my son to be treated? That's the way that you should treat somebody. Hi, how are you guys doing? It's nice to see both of you again. Welcome back. Yeah. I like Dr. Tran a lot. I think that we have a spiritual connection. I've talked to him a little bit about that connection. I believe that in a higher power and that my higher power put me in Dr. Tran's hands. Every time I see you, you look better. <laughs> so you just have to just keep seeing me. Obviously, that's it. I am extremely pleased with his progress, and the thing that pleased me the most, and the thing that actually gave me the most satisfaction for what I do, and the reason why I do this on a daily basis is patients like him. He comes in, he's essentially with dying, you're able to help him, and the most importantly is that you see him go back to his normal life, that he's able to be with his family, he's able to do whatever he wants to do, he's able to pursue his hobbies. We're going to go to the rodeo. And those are the most important things. Not that you can save somebody, but the fact that you actually see them in their normal life. That's what I thought. We've gone zero miles so far. For Ralph, normal life includes learning to deal with disabilities caused by the rupture. But with this experience has come a new outlook. He has become not only his old self, but an improved self. He has had a renaissance as an artist, and he is a uh, more, a kinder, gentler, more reflective person. I celebrate the day of my operation for my aneurysm as my rebirth day. I feel like a different person. So now I'm doing writing and other things to be creative as an artist. This is a haiku poem that I wrote when I realized the extent of my vision loss. And it goes, I am drinking in pictures like some wild beast at a shrinking water hole. Throughout his experience in ICU and at Harborview, I found that I recalled how much I love him. I fell in love with him all over again. And the fact that he was able to come back to me from where he was is just amazing to me. I wouldn't be without him. As in Ralph's case, aneurysms often go undetected because typically there are no symptoms unless they burst. And the risk factors are the same as for a variety of conditions, including other vascular problems. The typical thing that I would say is that if you're a male over the age of 65 and have a history of um, high blood pressure and smoking, then your risk of having aneurysm is much higher than the general public. Sometimes a test for some other condition will reveal the problem. Hello. Hi. Hey, how are you? How are you? Nice to see you, Mr. Willis. Gail Willis went to see his physician about stomach pain. He was referred to Dr. Starnes when an abdominal aortic aneurysm showed up on his MRI scan. I was really impressed the first time I saw him. 
He seemed like he was a very caring person, very knowledgeable, and he wanted to do something about our problem and fix it. And that's certainly what we were there for. Mr. Willis, he's a nice gentleman. He uh, was referred to me for evaluation of a very complicated juxtarenal aneurysm, which means that the aneurysm uh, extended all the way up to the uh, base of the arteries that feed the kidneys. I didn't know what it was, really. I didn't have any idea how life-threatening it was or any part of that. For Gail Willis, an endovascular procedure was the only viable option to repair his aneurysm. Due to his age and his overall health, an open surgical procedure would not have been possible. Ten years ago, we would not have offered you a, uh, an open operation. We would lucky. have just given you a fishing pole and a bottle of whiskey and said, uh, go off enjoy. and enjoy your life. Uh, <laughs> but now we have these minimally invasive means of treating the majority of vascular disease, and it's very exciting because we can do good things for our patients and increase the health status of the region. With endovascular aneurysm repair, effectively what we are doing is doing a minimally invasive operation to the patient, so therefore the stress of the operation is much less. At the same time, we're able to effectively do the operation quicker, so less time in the operating room. Dr. Starnes and his team have found that minimally invasive endovascular aneurysm repair is the best choice for the majority of their patients. We have found over the past 15 years with the advent of the endovascular revolution that uh, endovascular repair of aortic aneurysms uh, trumps open repair in every single category, death, uh, medical complications, and surgical complications. In fact, if uh, you undergo an open repair as compared to an endovascular repair or a minimally invasive repair, with that open repair, you are four times as likely to die the repair involves cutting off blood circulation to the aneurysm. The surgeon places a wire mesh stent graft in a sheath about the size of a pen and inserts it through the femoral artery in the groin area. When it reaches the site of the aneurysm, the sheath is removed and the stent graft deploys. We do that with the use of catheters, guide wires, sheaths, and x-ray. So we use x-ray as our vision uh, or a fluoroscopy unit to be able to x-ray the patient using low doses of radiation and see exactly where our wires and our catheters are going and to be able to deploy those grafts precisely in position. Once in place, the stent lines the inside of the artery, covering the weak spot in the vessel wall and cutting off blood to the aneurysm. In Gail's case, the aneurysm was located at the intersection of the arteries that feed his kidneys, so the team simultaneously used a specialized technique for preserving blood flow to those arteries. So this is Mr. Willis's follow-up CT scan, which shows a beautiful result of repair of his aneurysm with preservation of blood flow into each of these renal arteries and complete exclusion of the aneurysm sac without any evidence of endoleak. And we will follow him with serial ultrasound. We'll repeat his ultrasound in one year and annually thereafter. So extremely successful result of a very complicated procedure. Afterward, Gail and Lois found the graft fascinating. So this is what you have inside you, right here. Right. This is uh, an aortic stent graft. Is it's, that the approximate size? That's the size that you have in you. Yep. Really? That's the exact size, yep. Oh, and, wow. And it's a Dacron material here that is the same substance that we would use to sew in to your aorta to repair the aorta uh, through an open technique. Um, but this has, what you can see, are several of these stents that have been mounted along the side of the graft, and they're self-expanding stents. They, they're kind of springy. Mm -hmm. Well, they're springy. And um, the bare stent on top has these little barbs. You have to be careful because they'll skewer you. Oh, but they, uh, they anchor into the aortic wall there. So oh, you can take a look at that. That's what you have in you. Being an engineer, you probably appreciate oh. that. Uh, that's just like the Y duct on the 727 aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a sturgeon. A big sturgeon fish. I bet you that fish weighed 800 pounds. When it the success of the surgery is yet another second chance for Gail and Lois Willis. Divorced for a decade before they met, Gail had no intention of getting married again until he saw Lois working in the checkout line at the supermarket. 
I went through her line, and uh, I couldn't afford anything right then except chicken livers. That's what I had. <laughs> so I put those down on the counter, and she started to check them out, and I said, have you heard this joke? And no, she hadn't. And I told her the joke, and she laughed. And I thought, boy, what a beautiful laugh, you know. I love elderly patients. I love patients over the age of 65. They all have a uh, wonderful story to tell. And I just love uh, learning something about each of my patients and uh, creating that connection. Boy, these guys sure knew what they were doing when they That's designed they these old boats. With surgery behind them, Gail and Lois have a lot of things to do together. We've completely rebuilt this 1920s boat. We're almost there, and uh, then we can start doing troll caught salmon. Uh, we will also do long line for uh, halibut and cod. Then in season, when the tuna are in, uh, we'll go after tuna. See, that's all recalled, yep. and uh, this is all that's left to be done, and uh, this machine's ready to go. We're ready. <laughs> yeah, Salmon. we're ready. Salmon dinner. <laughs> the image on the upper right upper panel, that's post-contrast? Yeah. While refining surgical techniques to save lives in the OR, the UW Medicine Vascular Team pursues research to aid prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Dr. Tom Hatsukami is quietly revolutionizing how vascular disease is detected. Tom Hatsukami is perhaps our most prolific researcher in the division. Um, he has been involved in his career in no less than nine NIH funded grants and uh, has a research laboratory at South Lake Union where he is studying the features that would predict plaque rupture in the carotid arteries. UW Medicine has a very long history of research in this area. We've been involved in this for over 15 years. And there were very few centers around the country that were doing this type of research. Dr. Hatsukami and his team use magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, to look at the composition and structure of plaque in the carotid artery. The carotid is a major artery that supplies blood to the brain. Plaque is a buildup of cholesterol and tissue in the artery wall. When that plaque ruptures, pieces can travel to the brain, block the flow of blood, and cause a stroke. Dr. Hatsukami's research indicates that narrowing of the arteries alone is not as significant a risk factor for stroke as is the type and stability of the plaque itself. Dr. Hatsukami has told me that one of his colleagues describes the, a cross-section of the carotid artery as a donut, where the whole of the donut is the area where the blood flows through to the brain and the donut itself is actually the wall of the artery. What Tom will tell you is that it's not the whole of the donut we should be focusing on, it's the donut. And in so many past instances, we have been operating on patients due to degree of narrowing uh, of the artery, and that's not what's important. What's important is the character of the plaque that's causing that narrowing. Initially, the team studied plaque under the microscope after it had been removed from patients. The problem with looking at the plaque under the microscope is that you can't look at those features and see uh, what kind of risk that poses for future stroke because the lesion's already been excised. It's been removed from the patient. We were only able to answer that question once we were able to identify those features while it was still in the carotid artery in a living person. The team performed MRI scans on patients who were scheduled for surgery to remove plaque. After surgery, they examined the plaque under a microscope and compared what they found to the MRI images. They discovered that MRI allowed them to identify different types of plaque without an invasive procedure. With magnetic resonance imaging, we can identify which plaques are predominantly fibrous, uh, which plaques are predominantly calcified, which plaques uh, have a very large uh, cholesterol pool, and which plaques have uh, a large amount of hemorrhage or bleeding into the plaque. We believe that those unstable plaques are the ones that have hemorrhage into their lesions and uh, plaques that show evidence of small disruptions on the surface. Those unstable plaques are the ones that are most likely to cause a stroke in the future. This patient had a stroke. For patients, 
This research will eventually help to prevent strokes, which are the third leading cause of death and the leading cause of long-term disability in the United States. The key question is how can we screen for individuals for the presence of plaque and make the diagnosis early and perhaps do more preventative treatment uh, to try to prevent that plaque from progressing uh, to a stage where they need surgery. Most people do not have carotid disease and so would not need screening tests. Those at risk include people with diabetes, high cholesterol, prior heart attack or stroke, a history of smoking, or a family history of carotid plaque. For them, a screening test such as an ultrasound may be warranted. If the ultrasound reveals plaque, an MRI scan could be the diagnostic tool to identify unstable, vulnerable plaque and to determine the best treatment. My hope for the future is that uh, we could do a better job of selecting the most appropriate treatment for individuals. It would allow me to make a better decision that carotid surgery is the best form of treatment for this person, or that carotid stenting may be most appropriate for this person, or that person would be best served with more aggressive medical management. The benefits of this screening could eventually have a major impact on all of us. The cost of treating individuals with stroke, uh, stroke survivors is enormous in the billions of dollars and they project in 2050 it will be over a trillion dollars. And so if, if you can develop effective ways of prevention, early identification, early treatment, that would result in tremendous cost savings uh, to the healthcare community. Not to mention the, the saving an individual from the horrible disability of, of uh, suffering a stroke. He's going to revolutionize the way we image blood vessels and uh, that man is in my division. That is just really something to be very proud of. In both patient care and research, the strength of the UW Medicine Vascular Center lies in the teamwork. If I were a patient, the reason I would come to UW Medicine is because of the tremendous teamwork that you find here. It's not uh, just the team of physicians and surgeons, uh, it's the team of nurses, the staff, uh, the tremendous commitment of all the individuals. I think one of the greatest things about the two guys that I work with is that no matter what time of day or night, weekend, whatever, just pick up the phone and they said, you know what, I'll be right there. And that's all that you want to hear from your partners, that they will, you know, they'll be there to back you up. So essentially what he does is he just bypass the aneurysm. That teamwork translates into a first-class standard of care for patients. For Ralph Dockham and Gail Willis, it made all the difference in the world. It's never a real delight to be a patient that I know of, but the results have been delightful. They really are professional, and they have a background of knowledge that is very impressive. And it should be impressive to everybody that knows about it. Because it's nice to know that there's a medical center like that in this world, even.